Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel by Mark chapter 2. And as you're opening there, uh, we're looking at uh, one of the most needed and neglected uh, disciplines of Western culture and in America today. Uh, we're looking at biblical fasting, which is not a popular topic in the most overweight nation on earth, you know. Uh, so it's, it's not something we do very often, but often for at least the last three weeks. But as we open to Mark 2, 18 to 22, we're examining this topic that Jesus brings up, and he brings it up in the context of how we are to live for him, to be useful for him. And, and he introduces, if you remember, the sequence, the giving of gifts to poor, prayer, and then fasting. And we've been looking at that and looking at how they're related. So this morning, fasting is hungering for God. I mean, if you want to know uh, what we're talking about, it is hungering for God. And hungering for God so much, we neglect other things that are needful, necessary, but we do it intentionally. What's interesting is, and, and everyone has come and asked me, and they say, um, what are you talking about? Fasting from what? How often? How much can we eat? How much can't we eat? How much can we drink? How much can't we drink? Is it coffee? Is it, you know, is it Diet Coke? I mean, what do we fast from? Candy bars, potato chips. And I said, isn't it interesting the New Testament never quantifies what we're talking about. It doesn't say two days, ashes on your face, look bleak, get skinny. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't give a diet. It gives a goal. And see, that's the quality is what we're looking at. You know that you're fasting when that, that discipline stirs within you a longing for Christ and his return, because that's the goal. So weight loss and, and, and uh, you know, getting rid of cholesterol is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about hungering for God. And also, you can see on the screen, longing for Christ. And it has to involve denying our flesh. See, that's the, the ultimate aim of this is to, to say no to ungodliness and worldly lusts and to longingly await the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's how the Bible defines it. And it only comes when we experience God's grace. So this is our study. And this is what we're camping on for a while because we all need to ask ourselves an honest question. If we do a personal inventory, we can see this morning whether we're paddling against the current of our culture or if we're just floating downstream with them. Now, do any of you remember, I mean, I grew up in a little tiny Baptist church in, you know, Lansing, Michigan, and we used to, uh, I think it was the Red Cedar River, and we would go on church canoe rides. And what that meant is we would go to this place and, and they, we would hire these canoes and they would drive all the canoes upriver. And they, they knew which way the river flowed, and they knew if they got all these people in the canoes that even if they lost their paddles, they would all end up at the end, you know. And down there at the end was that canoe holder and the person, and, and he was, you know, grabbing the canoes as they went by and dumping the water out and sticking them up there. And, and they know that because of the current of the river, that even if you do nothing, you'll get there. That's how Christ describes the world. And he says, broad is the way, and many canoes are on it, and they're all going the same direction. They're floating downstream. And everyone's concerned about whether their canoe's nice and everybody else's canoes, and they're trying to get as much stuff in their canoe, and they're showing off to all the other people, and they're bumping each other. And in the midst of that, Jesus reaches down, meets us in the river, turns our canoe around, hands us the paddles, and says, you can't float anymore. You have to go against everyone else. You are counter-cultural. Now, that doesn't mean picketing and bombing abortion clinics and shooting, you know, the tillers of this world. It's to paddle your canoe against the current of the world which is the world is the culture we live in. And everyone in this world is living, as Paul describes them, whose God is their belly. That's, that's a good description. 
All the people floating down the river are all concerned about what they want and what they're eating and what they're desiring and their God is their belly of materialism or sensuality or of some substance or of hoarding as much stuff as they can or prolonging their beauty as long as they can or showing off their physique as much as they can or their brains or whatever. And everybody's preening and showing off and floating down the river and we're going, oh, excuse me, excuse me. And they go, what's wrong with you? We're saying, well, we're headed, th- why are you headed that way? We're going, as Bunyan said, to the celestial city. You are headed to the end of the line, which at the end of this river is a drop off into a literal black hole where you will be suffering the vengeance of eternal fire in the blackness of darkness forever. And it's called hell. And they laugh at us and they keep floating. But now and then, we'll bump into someone and they'll say, you have paddles, you're going the other direction, why? And you say, you know, I met Jesus. He stopped my canoe in its tracks, gave me some paddles, turned me around, and I can't wait to be with him forever. See, you know whether you're paddling by whether you feel the resistance See, if you just float along, there's no resistance in life. You just are like everybody else. You dress and talk and act and think and possess and accumulate and enjoy and complain like everybody else until Christ turns you around. And all of a sudden, everything looks different. You're looking at everybody. Try it sometime. Walk into an elevator and don't turn around. Just stand like this. (laughs) Everyone looks at you like, what is wrong with you? That's every day going upriver. The Broadway... The narrow way. The broad gate that leads to destruction, the narrow, Jesus said, difficult way that leads to him and endless life. Well, what is the question to find out whether you're paddling or just floating along with the flow of everyone else in life? Well, the question is simply this. How today is your hunger for God? Because you can tell if you're floating with the rest of the world, you have a a suppressed appetite. I remember when I was in seminary, what was the name of that drug? I used to sell for Wyeth Labs and, and American Home Products and Whitehall Labs, phenopropanolamine, I remember it now. And we used to sell phenopropanolamine because it made people not hungry. Now this is in the 80s when I don't think they checked all this stuff out and the diet things were going crazy. But did you know that the world dispenses a spiritual form of phenopropanolamine? And you know what that is? It suppresses our hunger for God. And fasting is a tool that that helps us begin to to find and trim away and cut off and, and divest from anything that neutralizes, suppresses, and 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 diminishes our hunger for God. So this morning, how is your hunger for God? Several weeks ago we began this study about hungering for God and saw that longing after Jesus with a heart of love and devotion is called biblical fasting. The New Testament doesn't say it means only eat salary and drink, you know, the soup. It doesn't say that like the three Hebrew boys, you know, in Babylon. No. It doesn't quantify it into some little thing that we can say, I'm doing more than you and you're not doing enough. See, that's, that's not New testament It's whether or not we're hungering more for God, his truth, and Christ's return than we were yesterday. If not, we need to do something. We need to remediate that situation. In the Old Testament, and basically I wrote these down for you, in the Old Testament, biblical fasting, uh, and remember, in the Old Testament, everything was very structured. It was an annual event to get serious about knowing God. And the whole nation had to participate and everything shut down and they had this national fast and everybody was checking to make sure you were fasting, you know. And, and there were some people that really got into it and they really did get serious about knowing God. But God says in the book of Isaiah that the vast, vast majority It was just something everyone did and they they didn't like it and they didn't want to do it and they had to do it and they'd get in trouble if they didn't do it and everybody was checking on them so they went through it and they made the most of it. By the time we get to the New Testament, biblical fasting was an ancient spiritual discipline. 
Now, we have to be really careful about this because nowadays we have this notion that if, you know, if the mystics did it or if the the monks did it or if, you know, Saint so-and-so of somewhere did it, it must be good because it's old, you know, and ancient and it's spiritual. No. It was an ancient spiritual discipline that went back to this Old Testament biblically described fast. But what it became in the New Testament was a time to reschedule my life with God at the center instead of everything else at the center. Which what, See, if we're floating with everybody else, we're listening to them, we're going along with them, we're saying, oh yeah, oh, I'll try that, yeah, it sounds good. And what is the world doing? Dining is at the center. I mean, I know people that they collect restaurants and it's gotta be more exotic. I mean, they've gotta have hummingbird tongues, you know, and they can't have anything common. They just, they, they could not eat normal food, dining. And I mean, their whole life is built around the kitchen. And uh, I mean, it's just an aura. They think that they're doing a, a cooking show, you know, to live in. Other people, it's relaxing. I mean, yeah, uh, a lot of that in America, amusing. Uh, gaming and all that and a lot of movie watching is amusing. Ah, muse, not think. Just carry it along. It's kind of the theme park, you know, just live for amusement accumulating we have more stuff per person than any culture or civilization has ever had in the history of earth here today most of us are accumulators and caring for all that stuff totally dissipates a lot of our emotional mental and physical energy advancing that's what some people are They're getting ahead in the world, and they're going to advance academically, business-wise, in their field, and that's really what they're focused on. And if it's sports, they will neglect anything to advance. And if it's, you know, business, they'll move anywhere to advance with the company. Leave the family behind if need be, but I'm going to advance. That's very much what the floaters are doing. How about securing? I'm going to accumulate enough stuff so no one can tell me what to do I mean, did you read that last week, the top five tech titans, the barons of, of the computer world, just last week, the five of them made $13.4 billion. They earned that much in one week between the five of them? Hmm. Yeah, they're securing their wealth. And a multitude of other things that are not wrong, they're just deadly to intimacy with the Almighty. And if we're floating and not paddling against that, pretty soon we're dining and relaxing and amusing and accumulating and advancing and securing and all that other stuff, and we're neglecting intimacy with God. So how is your hunger for God today? By the way, we get into the book of Acts and the epistles, we see biblical fasting shape their lives. They used it as a tool to shape their lives. They, they wanted, Paul said, I fast all the time. He says, I want to bring my body in unto the subjection under the lordship and rule of Jesus Christ. And I don't want my God to be my belly. And I'm constantly having my life shaped by this ancient spiritual discipline that I'm not going to quantify. Paul never, you know, Paul was great at explaining everything. He doesn't explain it. He just says, I do it more than you all because I long for his appearing. And their ministries. Did you know that people, when you get to Acts 14, people that are leading in the church are chosen and commissioned with the whole church fasting and praying? I mean, people were real stakeholders in the church and in ministry, so much so that they denied other things. Their worship, their outreach. I mean, when they were sending out missionaries, the whole church Paul was sent out. Can you imagine the accrual in heaven of the people that laid hands and sent Paul out on his first missionary journey, who who his work still extends to us today, and they were the ones that were set apart by the Holy Spirit to send him out? They're kind of like the founders of Amway. Do you remember back then where they got a quarter percent of everything? And and it's just unbelievable the, the spiritual benefit of having this fasting that shapes your life and ministry and worship. And finally, the early church, we see a hunger for God as a powerful way to yield every part of my life to God's supremacy. So, basically, the conclusion is this. Biblical fasting is an immediate way to declare your allegiance to God 
and to his way and glory in every part of our lives. So, early believers focused their lives on what mattered for eternity. Well, to chapter 2 now. Go to Mark with me. And what we see is the, the early believers had a heart for ministry. Now, before we read this, I want to show you what happened to them, okay? Uh, I'm going to read with you Mark 2, but I want you to see what the people that heard these words from Christ did. And we have this little snippet from uh, some ancient literature, but I'm going to read you the whole thing, but just the center is this. About A.D. 133, Aristides, he was a teacher of philosophy in the Roman province of Asia, modern Turkey, presented to the emperor Hadrian, the great builder, he built the Pantheon and a lot of other stuff if you are into Roman culture. Uh, Hadrian wanted to know what to do with these Christians. They were just multiplying. I mean, Nero tried to, you know, wipe them out and, and, and they, they just multiplied. So this man presented a defense and this is what he said. Now the Christians, O king, have the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ himself engraven on their hearts. And they observe, looking for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. They do not covet men's goods. They love their neighbors. They despise not the widow. They grieve not the orphan. He that hath distributeth liberally to him that hath not. If they see a stranger, they bring him under their roof and they rejoice over him as if it was their own brother. For they call themselves brethren, not after the flesh, but after the spirit and in God. Now this note, this is amazing. And if there is among them a man that is poor and needy, and they have not an abundance of necessities, they fast two or three days that they may supply the needy with their necessary food. When's the last time you did that? Don't tell us, but it's rare. Most of us think that when I have, you know, my tuition and my car, you know, all nice and all my electronic stuff and, you know, my, you know, spring break trip all figured out and everything else paid for and little coffee time, whatever's left, I might give to someone if they really need it and I think they're legit. That's our float down the stream mindset. Me first, my needs, take care of everything, be comfortable, secure, and everything else. But for Christ's sake, the early Christians were ready to lay down their lives. And so the, the record of the first century church was, behold how they love one another. I guess the question for all of us this morning is, what will we be known for? Will it be that we're willing to die for Christ and even more that we're willing to live for him by loving people and his enemies? The early Christians fasted so they would have more to give to the needy. That means they did not have a lot stored up. Accounts like that from history are stirring. Isn't that stirring? I mean, that's, wow. But that isn't why we fast. You don't, you don't say because St. Onephorus of, you know, Cyprius did this, we want to too. No. That's why we go to Mark chapter 2. Because let's look at what the original setting was that Christ had. So everybody, Mark chapter 2, we're going to read from verse 20 to 22. Let's all stand with your Bibles open, follow along. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a phrase and then I'm going to comment on it, okay? I'll be a little bit like Ezra. Ezra made the whole nation of Israel, 50,000 of them, stand while he read all day long for six hours on a platform, and he would read and explain and read and explain and read and explain. Wouldn't that be a service? Six hours long. Wow. Let's not do that. Okay. Uh, here are Christ's words, and these are the most important words in the Bible on fasting for us. And if you understand what Jesus is saying, this can be life-altering. Okay? Verse 20. But the, Mark 2.20, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Now look up. What is this talking about? This is again, Jesus is saying, I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to rise again. And then I'm going to ascend back to my father and sit at his right hand. This is Jesus talking about his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. And he says, I'm the bridegroom. You're my bride. 
I'm going to be taken away from you. And just like the bride every day was looking at her calendar and, and wondering, maybe it's today, maybe it's today, maybe it's today, maybe he's going to come. I want to be ready at any moment. He might come at night. He might come. I don't know when. I want to be ready. Look at verse 20. The days will come when your bridegroom will be taken away from them. Now look at the next phrase. And then they will fast in those days. Who's that? That's everybody who's been purchased, bought, redeemed, forgiven, and indwelt by Christ. They, that's all New Testament believers. Then they will fast in those days. Jesus said that fasting would be universal in his church. Ooh. Eating might be. Fasting is not. Why? Well, look at verse 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth, that's the, the New Covenant church, on an old garment, that's Judaism. Or else the new piece pulls away from the old and its tear is made worse. Verse 22, no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts the wineskins and the, old, and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine is put into new wineskins. What's he talking about? He's talking about not an external, you must fast on this day and, and, and look sad and don't talk. But it's a transformational I'm engaged to him, and I miss him so much that I can't help but think about him every day and wonder if he's going to come and get me today. That's the underlying motivation for fasting, and it changes our lives. Let's bow. Father, I pray that you'd teach us a little bit of what it means to long for your appearing and not to worry about the mechanics of fasting, but to want the benefits and results of a growing hunger for you, O oh God, and a growing longing to see Jesus, to see you face to face and be like you, because we will see you as you are. I pray you would stir our hearts today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, have you ever thought about how focused the first century church was? This is why. This is why when we read the, the epistles, we find people that are really on target. And how did the first centuries live in a way that we so often don't? Well, when we look at, at the epistles, especially, in fact, let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. You're in Mark. Go to the right. Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 3. There it is. As you turn there, think about where we've gotten do we ever grow weary and lessen in our passion for what the early church had? Yes, we do. Do we ever think more of our careers and lives and needs than we do of lost people all around us? Do we ever even lose sight that they're lost? Do we even, sometimes we're just floating with the canoes and we kind of enjoy it. It's kind of fun. You just feel a part of everything. It's very embarrassing to stand facing everybody in the elevator. It's very, 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 very hard to to go upstream. And, and we're the only ones paddling. They're floating. They don't even have paddles. They, they can't even go that way. And they're just so curious about us and mocking us. One of the key attitudes we find displayed in God's saints is that all of them were exiles on earth. You see, the writer of Hebrews says, these all died in faith, looking for something, a city that has foundations. They were pilgrims here on earth. They were exiles here on earth. And Philippians is going to tell us they were not citizens of earth. They were citizens of heaven. And that's where they were headed. And everybody knew it and saw it. Well, what did this produce? It didn't produce a detachment from earthly life or other people. Rather, it led to such a lack of love for things that these early saints actually had abundant time to love and seek and win their neighbors. Now that is an interesting thought. Have you ever thought of all the time we spend gathering, protecting, and caring for our things? In the last week, how much of your time has been managing things instead of loving, listening, interacting with people. 
Think of what value that collecting and protecting and caring for things will have in heaven at Christ's throne versus the same time and energy and strength poured out in a loving passion for the souls of our neighbors. Do you think the most gleaming, I mean, I was riding this morning behind someone that was pretty excited. They had the biggest boat you've ever seen. The one motor was the size of a normal motor. The other motor, I don't think I've ever seen one. I mean, it was as big as my first car almost, you know. And they had the shiniest boat. It couldn't have been like that. They had to have worked on it. And they were so, I mean, I could see those men, um, when, when finally they turned, I could see, they were so excited. I don't know what they were doing. Probably they were just going to go sit in a parking lot in the thing and just rub it with the cloths. I don't know what they were doing. But they were excited about caring for that gorgeous boat. You say, oh, that's, you know, I would never do that. No, but we, we do other things very similarly with things. Would Kalamazoo be shocked if the hundreds of families at Calvary Bible Church started thinking of others more than about their own things? Isn't that interesting to think about? Did you know I just described what happened across the Roman world? Churches began to spring up among the people that were self-centered, and these churches were others-centered and selfless and, and different. They were headed a different way, they were going upstream, and everybody was curious. Now, they made fun of them and they mocked them, but down deep they were curious about them. Did you know the way to win the world is not to float down the river with them? That's church growth ideas. You just don't rock anybody's boat. You just float together and hope some of them go to heaven and that the Lord pulls you out before you go over the cliff. And you just don't, don't offend any of them. Don't tell them that they're headed to destruction. Don't tell them that their lifestyles are an abomination in the sight of God. Don't tell them about the narrow way. Just float. Wow. Well, biblical fasting reflected their longing for heaven. Look at Philippians 3. I told you to turn with me to Philippians 3, and we're going to read from uh, verse 19 onward. Whose end is destruction. Remember the end of the river? He's talking about fellow floaters. We're all born floating, and everybody floating down that river, their end is destruction. They're going to the blackness of darkness forever. Whose God is their belly. What characterizes them is their insatiable appetites. Uh, whether it be for thrills or substances or for, you know, promoting themselves or sexual gratification or athletic gratification. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's centered on me. And my God is what I hunger for. As Paul eloquently says, their belly. And look at this, whose glory is in their shame. But what's the bottom line? Look at the end of verse 19. Who set their mind on earthly things. Their, their, their life is around the boat or the cottage or the job or the 403 or the 401 or the, you know, the next award ceremony or the next concert or the next a little higher ranking in the games or whatever. But all of it is, is tied to the earth. And that's the description of a lost person. And the problem is many 21st century believers act and orient their lives like lost people. And that's why the gospel isn't powerfully going out, because we're not living the narrow way. We're floating the broad way. Look at verse 20 of Philippians 3. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, upstream from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. He said, I long for Christ. Now, keep going to the right to 1 Thessalonians. So jump over Colossians and go to 1 Thessalonians 1. This is Paul's first epistle. And look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 1, starting in verse 9. Uh, 
he, he's hearing about their testimony. Paul has ministered there for a few weeks and he left and word came back to him of the believers in Thessalonica and it says, for they themselves, verse nine, declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So this is people in Thessalonica were telling others how God had transformed their life and they no longer were oriented toward the, the idols of this world and they were turned to God now look at verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. They were telling all the floaters around them that they were headed to a horrible cataclysmic end. And they said, we're waiting for his son from heaven. He's the one that delivered us from the wrath to come. Now keep going to the right. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, First Timothy. Go to Second Timothy, chapter four. Look at Paul's. This is the end of his life. He's in the Mamertine prison. He's headed toward beheading, probably uh, in one of Nero's circuses, uh, the the big. Uh, places where they had all their chariot races and other things. And this is what Paul says. Finally, he, you know, he's already said, my departure is at hand, I'm ready to go. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Yeah, Paul, you should have one. You've written half the New Testament. You've started almost every church outside of, uh, you know, the Israelite people. They're all the Gentiles. All of us are spiritual great-great-grandchildren of Paul. I mean, yeah, you ought to get a crown, Paul. But look at this in verse 8, but not to me only, but also to everyone who has loved his appearing. Paul said, we're all going to get the same crown for longing for Christ. That's why Paul said, I constantly long for Christ. And that's why Paul said, I fast more than the rest of you do. There's something inextricably connected Prayer and fasting with a longing for Christ's return. Uh, keep going to the next book, Titus chapter 2. You should know Titus well, and my favorite part of it is 11 to 13 of chapter 2. And this distills down salvation. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And what does salvation's grace do to us? Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. How do you do that? Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. One more. Go past Titus and Philemon to Hebrews chapter 9. And I just want to show you one more. Hebrews 9. The writer of Hebrews describes salvation. Uh, in verse 27, he says, it's appointed unto, uh, to men to die once and after this judgment. So, uh, we only live once. We don't, you know, do the Shirley MacLaine thing over and over again, you know. Uh, we, we die and face judgment. Or, look at verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many and to those who eagerly wait for him, those who have received his gift of dying for and bearing the sins, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. Eagerly wait. Do you know what the scriptures say characterizes a believer? We eagerly wait for Christ. We long for his appearing. That's, that's the essence. And that's how the church started out. But guess what? Keep going to the right. Go to Revelation. Did you know that the grandchildren of the day of Pentecost already were dulled? And the Bible tells us why. What's the big problem that dulls the church? It's in Revelation 3.15. Most of us have caught the enthusiasm of the early church in Acts and the Epistles. It's just legendary. They were contagiously in love with Jesus. They were fearlessly proclaiming his truth. Most of us have also caught that by the time two generations passed, we find the grandchildren of Pentecost quite different. There's a dramatic change. Revelation 3, 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now what would make such a horrible, gross image of Christ vomiting believers? What? What would prompt that? I remember when we were raising kids, the pharmacist gave us Ipecac, 
even sounds like, you know, ipecac. And they said, boy, they swallow too many pills. Just hold their nose and give them some of that, and it'll all come out, whatever they've got in there. Ipecac. What ipecac Christ? It's in verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Now, wait. That, that is a biblical statement of the American dream. Isn't that what everybody wants? Either get it in the lottery, or work your whole life and kill yourself, or be a flash trader like that little guy in London and make 40 million overnight. But do something to be rich so that you can use the riches to, to get enough stuff to surround you so that you feel really comfortable and secure and come to the place where you have need of nothing and you're self-reliant, self-made, successful. Did you know people say, oh, we've got a, you know, America, we've got a America, we've got to have, you know, the free enterprise system, we've got to have this, spread it all over the world. Don't. Don't. Mm, may our economy not prosper because it's causing the worst infection of the church. We are infected with materialism. We think that the reason we go to school and learn a craft and learn an art and learn a, a form of work and look for shop for jobs is so we can be rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing. And Jesus says, while I look at you pursuing that course, you don't know that I see you as wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked because you are focusing not on my return but on your canoe and floating through life with a bigger canoe than everybody else and a more comfortable and secure one. Verse 18, I counsel you, buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness. Now that's interesting, that shame of nakedness. You know what John, the apostle that wrote these, you know, recorded Christ's words here? Do you know what he said in 1 John? He says, I don't want to be ashamed before you at your coming. He says, I don't want to have neglected clothing myself with, with the righteous deeds of the saints and instead clothing myself with the finest of the Asia Minor garments and white garments that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. As many as I love, verse 19, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. The secret to what deadened and dulled and chilled and dissipated the power of the early church is right here. It is an attachment to the things of this world. And actually to be agitated and angry and fighting over and protecting, like it says in Ecclesiastes, the more you have, the more you want. The more you want, the more other people want it. And the more they want it, the more you protect it. And, and it just is a vicious cycle. Wow. What's the bottom line? The early church, by the third generation, began to focus on this world, not the next. And what happens is they began to display the danger of misplaced desires. If you want to go back where we started to Matthew chapter 6, um, and we don't have to go anywhere else after that, so just get back to the Gospels, Matthew chapter 6. I want to show you the context of how we even got to this. Matthew 6 starts with giving to poor people, you know, the first four verses. Then it gets into prayer. And then by the time we get to verse 16 of chapter 6, it gets into this fasting deal that Jesus talks up. And then he says in verse 19, don't lay up treasures. And in verse 22, watch out that, that you don't have your eyes set on things that aren't good. And verse 24, you can't serve God in money. And verse 25, you know you're serving money when you're worrying and worrying and worrying all the way down to verse 31. And then he says in verse 33, the problem is you have misplaced desires. Because God says in verse 33, seek first the reign and supremacy of God in your life and everything else follows because he brings it in. And you don't have to spend your life scrapping and scraping and, and fighting and climbing to get it all. The danger of misplaced desires. Well, one author who I admire greatly, pastor of, I don't know, 40 years now, he's uh, emeritus pastor, John Piper, 
wrote this about the enemies of hungering for God. He said, the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. It's not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven. It's the endless nibbling at the table of the world. It's not the X-rated video. It's the primetime dribble of triviality that we drink every night. For all the evil Satan can do, when God describes what kept people from the banquet of his love, it was a piece of land, a yoke of oxen, and a wife. Do you remember Jesus said, come follow me? And the guy says, I've got a new yoke of oxen. Come follow me, no, I've got to buy some land. Come follow me, no, I'm going to get married. It was, it was not bad stuff. The greatest adversary to the love of God is not his enemies, but its gifts. And the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. That's why Jesus said to the final stage of church history, by the way, the one we live in, he says, your lifestyle of materialism Ipecax me. I want to vomit you. So what was the solution? Well, that's what we started on. Look at verse 9 of chapter 6. In this manner, therefore, pray. It was praying daily for spiritual hunger, praying for the kingdom of God, praying for the reign of God as supreme over my life. That's what fasting does. It's how I, it's a tool to get me back on track with my life scheduled not around consumption, but about God. We want God's rule over our appetites. We want him to rule our affections. We want him to rule over our choices. We even want him to rule over the church. It's not ours. It's his. And so it changes everything. In fact, we could say that the benefits of hungering for God is the more we experience intimacy and fellowship with him, the more we hunger for him. It's just kind of, it's the same thing, the more you want, the more you have, the more you have, the more you want more and all that. The more of God you have, the more you want. The more of him you experience, the more you want. Hunger for God prompts hating any beachhead of sin in our life. And that's usually when we're, we're in this process of self-denial, we start seeing more that we need to ask God to mortify in our life. Hunger for God stirs our investing time in his body, the church. I mean, if the major focus of God at this time in all the universe is the church, why isn't it ours? It's everything else. God will take care of the church. We've got to worry about everything else. You associate with what the one you love the most associates with. That's very, very much what the Lord is saying. This is what I love. This is what you should love. So basically... Biblical fasting helps us focus on why we're here, what we're doing with our time and energy. Now go back to where we started. Think of all the time we spend gathering, protecting, and caring for our things. Then think of the value of the collecting, protecting, and caring we'll have in heaven at Christ's throne versus the same time invested in what he left us here to do. You know, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians six twelve. Paul says, all things are lawful unto me, but I'll not be brought into the power of any of them. All things are lawful unto me, but I will not be mastered by anything but Christ. What's amazing is, what pushes out our hunger for experiencing God is usually good stuff. It's food, it's entertainment, it's the latest news, it's the status of our investments, it's the internet, it's... It's media, music, sports, bodybuilding, health needs. All of these all alone are good and worthy of time, but not at God's expense. So, where we began, what are you longing for this morning? What are you incurably hungering after? Is it God or is it the world? Are you incurably delighting in God's word or trivial pursuits? The greatest destroyers of intimate hunger for God may be the things that are good and right in their place, like coffee and lawns and hobby and travel and retirement planning and mall walking and movie watching and computer mastering. But any of those that take God's first place, any of those that become easier for me to turn to than God and his word, 
Then they become deadly destroyers of my hungering and thirsting after God. That's why we're studying fasting. Because we're rich. We're increased with so many distractions. And most of the time, until our boat gets rocked, we don't need anything. But the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should go through life soberly, righteously, and in godly fear, looking for the blessed appearing and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what he left us to do, going on the narrow way. Let's all stand together. It's time to go. And as we stand... I remind you that the invitation is always open. Uh, there are always our elders and our Titus II women. They're here at the front. You'll see them. They stand up here near the front, and they have a Bible in their hand. The, the really good news is not only they are here, but Jesus Christ is here. And there's two things you might think about this morning. One is if you say, uh, wow, yeah, I'm distracted. I am accumulating. I'm spending all my time taking care of this stuff, then Jesus is here, and he actually knows that. He was actually poking you. Talk to him. Say, Lord, I want to start making incremental steps to phenopropanolamine my life, to suppress my hunger for things. And I want to increase my hunger for you. That's the first response. The second response is, I don't even know what you're talking about, but I don't want to go over the, I don't want to go in the black hole. Then you might need to call out to the Lord and say, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's only two responses. Come to Christ, follow Christ. That's it. Let's bow before him this morning. Father in heaven, I pray that you will stir our hearts to not just hear that we're supposed to be longing for you, but to do it. To not just hear until your return were to be fasting, but to do it. To not just say, well, that's for someone else. I'm at the most important time of my life, of my career. We don't even know if we'll be alive tomorrow. Shouldn't we be doing today what you've asked us to do and not hope that someday in the future we'll get around to it? While we hear your voice today, I pray we would respond. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you as you go.